I'm going to talk today about linked data, data linkage. It, this is, li linked data is something that is almost universally relevant to research. It, it pro cops up, props up in lots of fields and service provision and computer science and data science and health research and social research and all sorts of areas. And there's lots of different terminologies around uh, it. Now, I come from a background of health research. I'm an epidemiologist, primarily. Uh, also had some training in economics, though, so uh, particularly the statistical terminologies can vary a lot across disciplines. Uh, I try to sort of highlight where that might be the case, but if you've, uh, if you've got any questions or you don't understand the terms that I'm using, please feel free to interrupt me or put your hand up and, uh, we'll, uh, uh, and, and, and don't be afraid. We'll, um, it's better that we're all on the same page. If, if, if you don't understand something I've said, chances are somebody else in the room doesn't either. So linked data is really, well, so there's going to be three, uh, th three parts to today's talk. The first part, uh, I'm going to be talking about the practical, some practical aspects and sort of what is linked data and how can you access it and what can you use it for. Uh, and then the second two parts of the day, I'm going to be talking about methodological problems that you might run into. Uh, firstly, problems generic to the use of administrative data, because when we, we as researchers talk about linked data, we're often talking about secondary data. So this is data that hasn't been collected for research purposes. So I'm going to talk about problems that are generic to use of secondary data for research. And then I'm going to talk about linkage error, which is what goes wrong when data are linked. Uh, so first part, practical aspects. We're going to talk about what is data linkage, uh, what can you use linked data for, how are records linked, how, is, how, how does data linkage actually operate, and uh, how can you access it. I'm going to run through this section fairly quickly and focus more on the methodological uh, topics later on. For the large part, this is stuff that you'll that, that 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 varies a lot depending on what sort of data you want to use, and you'll have to uh, navigate these minefields for yourselves. So, OECD has a definition for data linkage that is emerging that brings together information from two or more sources of data with the object of consolidating facts concerning an individual or an event or an entity that are not available in any single record. Now, so I, uh, the, 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 the classic example are when you've got two different files that you want to merge together and people are, the same people appear in both files but the, you've got different information about them. So you might have information about their hospital, uh, attendances, admissions in one file, and you might want to link it to information from a register of deaths to work out how, l how, uh, you know, how many of the people or how long it took for people uh, who'd been admitted to hospital to die afterwards. Uh, but data linkage also happen can happen within a single file. So when data are not recorded in the unit of analysis that you want to use. So say if you're interested in people and a file of hospital admissions, uh, ho hospital data is recorded in the level of admissions and linking those admissions together. So as you can tell, okay, these two admissions relate to the same person. That in itself is data linkage, even though it's only one file that you're working with. So what is linkage used for? Obviously to merge information, that's a bit of a redundant definition. Uh, it can be used to evaluate data quality by triangulating against external reference data. Uh, it's used just in service provision and sort of core business activities. You can think like if services need to be coordinated or merged or companies need to be merged or lists of uh, clients need to be merged. These are data linkage problems. Uh, but what 
we're primarily interested in, well, I'm primarily interested in anyway as a researcher, is what new research questions you can address by bringing um, information from different places together into the same place. So some examples of research questions by linking uh, information on, uh, on flight arrivals to hospital data. Researchers are able to demonstrate the increased risk of venous thromboembolism, so this is blood clots in your veins that you get from regular long-haul flights. So, and this research utilised data from, administrative data from uh, a, a, about uh, passengers, passenger information from uh, flights, linked that to patient information from hospitals to be able to demonstrate the increased risk of thromboembolism associated with long-haul flying. Another example uh, is where the researchers were able to look at the increased risk of mortality experienced by patients undergoing treatment for uh, drug, pro drug use problems uh, in the time period shortly after discharge from hospital. So when, pa when patients, you know, who might have had a heavy drug problem, were in hospital, were off the drugs, then are discharged out into the community, go find themselves, uh, uh, find themselves a new supply of drugs and um, are at increased risk of overdose because of their reduced uh, tolerance from the time spent in hospital. And so this is another example of research that was able to be conducted by linking together um, data, in this case from uh, drug treatment registrations with death registers and hospital data. So how are data linked? <laughs> Very quickly and broadly, there are two different approaches to linking records. There's deterministic approaches which are based on rules of agreement, so like if these records agree on name and agree on date of birth and agree on address, then we'll treat them as if they're the same person, right? So that's a, that's a, a, a rule based on a pattern of agreement over a set of matching variables, name, address, date of birth, that kind of thing. Um, probabilistic linkage, in, in, in probabilistic linkage, every possible pattern of agreement is assigned a, a score that can be translated into an estimate of the likelihood that, it, that a pair that exhibits that pattern of agreement across matching variables is a match or is not a match. So an estimate of the probability associated with that or the likelihood. Depending on how these are implemented, they can be, they can produce very different results or they can produce exactly the same results. So there's a lot of opportunities to tweak and modify each of these procedures in terms of defining how you set the rules and how you set the parameters up in the probabilistic linkage and they can be a perfectly equivalent procedures or they can be very different. Uh, but generally, probabilistic linkage is more flexible because it allows you to accommodate larger numbers of matching variables much easier. You can imagine if you have to work out which rules to use when you've got 10 different matching variables, there's two to the 10 different possible patterns of agreement that could appear in your data. So it's very difficult to work out which rules of agreement you should incorporate into your linkage. Um, probabilistic linkage makes it much easier to uh, accommodate large numbers of matching variables. I'm currently doing a linkage with 23 matching variables. Uh, it's easier to accommodate distance measures of partial agreement. So, you know, John with an H and John without out an H, we might go, okay, well, these are pretty similar. They're not perfect, but they're pretty similar. And maybe that's sort of 75% agreement. You can have these, these, these sort of continuous measures of partial agreement. You can factor those into probabilistic linkage much more easily. Um, and you can accommodate frequency-based weights. So agreement on doige, which is a quite a rare name, is much more likely to mean that a record pair is a match than agreement on 
Smith. All right, so these are things that are difficult to incorporate into deterministic rule-based approaches. Um, and so generally probabilistic linkage is more flexible and can be more sensitive and so can work better. Um, so it can detect more of the matches than deterministic linkage. But deterministic linkage is generally simpler, easier to implement, easier to interpret. So, how to access linked data? Basic questions you need to work through are, you know, who own the data? You've got probably two different sources of data at least that you want to join together. You need to work out who the data providers for those different um, data sources are and they may operate within different legal um, uh, constraints. They ha might have different administrative processes. Um, a, big, uh, a very relevant question is, are, ha have the data already been linked? Some data are linked routinely um, or will you, are you asking for this data to be linked specifically for your research project? Um, where are you going to store the data during analysis? The requirements can differ between data providers. Uh, some might expect you to run your analysis on their systems. They won't let the data leave their own safe haven. Some will be happy to hand it over to you. Sometimes you might be able to use a third party safe haven like the ones that are provided by the Office for National Statistics or the ADRN. So I mentioned ago, you know, are the data already linked? So there's sort of two models for data linkage. One is uh, this sort of project by project ad hoc linkage, uh, which is often what's done in England, but in various other places around the world, including Wales and Scotland and Australia and Canada, and um, they're, they're, they're establishing systems for routine, ongoing linkage of ad administrative data, uh, where various high-value data sources, like health, you know, high-value health data, like hospitalization data, and high-value social data, like education data, are, uh, are routinely linked every year in order to make them available for an unspecified range of sort of future research projects. Uh, the, the, one of the big advantages of routine ongoing linkage, apart from the efficiencies and economies of scale, is that uh, the more data that are linked together, the better the linkage becomes. So the more likely you are to know that somebody changed their name when they got married or moved addresses and so you're, you, you can then pick up these differences that occur in the data set. If you're only linking two files together, then you've got much less information about the, you know, the different names that people use and the different addresses that they've lived at. Uh, but there isn't much routine linkage happening in England, unfortunately. Some examples of the Oxford Record Linkage System, uh, the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, uh, hospital episodes are routinely linked to ONS mortality data. They, these are all pretty much within health, not across disciplines, unfortunately. And, and, and they're also often local area or geography. Uh, restricted to certain areas like Oxford or Bradford. Uh, now, in terms of who's going to do the linkage, sometimes it's a data provider might do this for you. It'll, it's very rare that you'll be doing any linkage yourself as a researcher because it generally requires access to the identifiable data, names, addresses, dates of birth, which providers a uh, much less willing to share and you're not actually interested in as a researcher you're, only, you're, you're generally only interested in the substantive variables the clinical variables the payload data you don't you, you, you don't care who somebody is only what happens to them or what what they do so uh, a, a, a sort of best practice model for data linkage is the trusted is known as trusted third party and in this model, you might have two data providers who will send a file of just their 
identifiers. So just the names, addresses, and, and any variables that are going to be used for matching for the record linkage to a trusted third party or a data linkage unit who performs the linkage on these variables without ever seeing any of the sensitive clinical data or payload data. Uh, creates uh, cre creates a, a pseudo ID, a random number to uh, assign to each person, sends that random number back to the data custodians who then have, uh, uh, who then have data that is essentially linked already because study ID or a, some, a, some sort of pseudo ID appears in both of their data files but they don't have access to each other's data. But now they can send to researchers a file that contains the clinical or service data that researchers are interested in and this random study ID with all of the identifying information, names and addresses stripped away. So the linkage unit or trusted third party only handles the identifiable data and no sensitive cl clinical data and the researchers only handle the sensitive clinical data and not the identifiers which are sensitive in their own right. And there's no uh, unnecessary disclosure of information between the data providers either. So this is called, known as a trusted third party model of data linkage and it's generally considered a sort of best practice. So, uh, what are some of the things you're going to, practical things you're going to have to consider in applying for administrative data at least? Um, a whole series of approvals that are likely to be required. So, approvals from the data providers and there can be multiple uh, there, 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 there can be multiple stakeholders within the data providers that you usually need to get through. So, you know, the, the, the Caldecott guardians or committees who uh, oversee the, uh, sort of approve the release of data for research. They might need to separately approve the release of identifiable data for linkage. Um, the data processing team, the people who are actually going to process the data and give it to you, they've got to be on board and understand what you want them to do with the data, how you want the data to come out of the provider. Um, the data linkers will need to be on board. The ethics committees and there may be different ethics committees required for different data providers. Um, if you're accessing health data without consent, then it will need to go to something called CAG, the Confidentiality Advisory Group. Um, your own institutions like that have data protection offices, etc, etc. Um, the timescales for navigating all of these approvals can be anywhere from, in my experience, I certainly have never had anything uh, close to three months. I'm currently working on, uh, I'm currently, uh, I've got an English project that is pushing three years now and an Australian project that we have the data after six years of, um, of negotiating and renegotiating with government departments and uh, sort of you have this long list of delays and changes in this uh, <laughs> in this process so you know the ad across a period of three or six years the administrative processes can change the administrative personnel will certainly change if you're if, if it's in the public sector um, Data security requirements can change, legislation can change, agreements between the data providers can change. Um, the scope of your data request may well evolve in that time and the approvals that you acquired early in the process are likely to, you know, may need to be renewed or may expire before you get to the end of it. Uh, it's worth acknowledging, I think, if you want to, if you're talking about accessing public administrative data, that the average uh, public servant or bureaucrat really doesn't stand to gain anything at all by letting you have their data and they have the world to lose. If it blows up in their face, if there's some media fiasco about inappropriate use or access of 
uh, government data and the media love to make a fiasco about uh, anything data, you know, breach and confidentiality uh, and privacy related, then, you know, their career may go down the toilet. And so there's a lot of incentive. They don't, they, 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 there's some sort of perverse incentives built in to the system, I think, to, uh, you know, in, encourage these processes to be strung out and scrutinised. Uh, I mean, I mean they, it, it's right that they should be scrutinised, but it's not right that they should take six years. Uh, costs can vary wildly, anywhere from nil to, uh, I know, sort of one routinely linked uh, health data set that costs, that a full extract of that will cost 200 grand per year to access. Uh, so on these, on, on the note of these sort of costs and time scales, if you're doing a PhD and you want to incorporate linked data into, uh, in, into a doctoral program or anything, if you're talking about accessing new linked data, you know, project or data that you don't have yet or that your supervisors don't have, I strongly suggest that you have a, that, like, that's fine, that's great, it's ambitious, but have a plan B. <laughs> I, 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 I did that, that's what I did for my PhD and now I've you know, got this project that is up and running and I can keep working on in my postdoctoral years. But I couldn't use it in my PhD. So, on to the interesting stuff. Methodological challenges. Administrative data. So, um, so often when we're linking data, we, one of the data sets we're linking might be a primary data set, so that's data that's been specifically collected for research. We might be working with you know, a, a, a cohort study or a trial, and sometimes these are supplemented, um, augmented with uh, data linkage to administrative data sets or registry data sets. So there's, there's sort of a spectrum of data. You've got primary data at one end, which has been collected specifically for research. You've got administrative data at the other end, which is, which, which is, collect, which, which is a sort of a byproduct of running a service uh, or, a, or a business. And registry data falls somewhere in the middle. So this is like register of deaths, register of births, register of uh, you know, cancer registries, things like that. They, these are sort of semi-administrative data, but they are collected for research, just not necessarily your research project specifically, they're being collected for um, a non-specific range of, um, of, of, of research and, uh, and, 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 and monitoring purposes. So we're going to talk about, we're talking about secondary data here, particularly administrative data that hasn't been collected for research. Uh, to understanding the recording and quality of that administrative data, understanding the population coverage of the data set, and, and, and highlight how it's really important to understand what is actually causing this data to be recorded. Because it's not your study. So, administrative data, I think we've covered this. Routinely collected data could be from it could be related to financial management, so hospital episode statistics. If you're working in health data, you should know what those are. They're all about hospitals being reimbursed for the um, services they provide. They're not about collecting, they're about surveilling their population of patients for research or any other purposes. They're about getting paid. And, um, uh, and, and they're coded with that, really, that one purpose in mind. Recorded and coded. Um, and it affects what's recorded and how it's recorded. Uh, it could be clinical management and audit, registration services we've covered. Um, sometimes it's collected for service evaluation and deliver, delivery, um, etc. So some questions to ask when anytime you're using administrative data that will help you understand uh, some of the quality issues were, you know, why were the data collected? 
which data had to be collected for this purpose and which data didn't have to be collected for this purpose, which like, but were collected anyway. And these might vary quite differently in, in terms of quality. Um, which relevant data were not collected because they weren't required. Um, what unit were the data recorded in? So, I mean, were they recorded as people? Not usually when you're talking about services or administrative data, usually it's some sort of event like a hospital admission. Um, if it's not your intended an unit of analysis, how was the data internally linked or how are you going to link it? So, a lot of an work is done with single data sets like hospital episode statistics without the analyst or researcher really appreciating that this is data that has been already linked. Um, and because it's already been linked, it, you know, it wasn't recorded at the level of the person, it was recorded at the level of the admission there. That linkage might have errors. It's certainly not going to be perfect. Um, and failure to consider and account for these errors in your analysis can um, mess up your results or the conclusions you want to uh, take from them. How were the data recorded? So, like, uh, who recorded the data? Was it the was it a person who provided the service? Was it uh, a coder working with clinical notes? Was it, you know, uh, was it recorded in free text fields, even if that was meant to be, you know, that if people were only had a certain set of responses that they were meant to put in that text field, there's a big difference between whether they're allowed to enter that set as a as free text or whether they have to choose it from a drop-down box. You know, that even just things like this affect the quality of the data that is recorded because drop-down boxes, of course, are less subject to uh, mistakes, perhaps. Anyway, uh, was there any validation or quality assurance processes that went into the data after it had been entered into this database and has the recording practices changed over time or have the validation and quality assurance changed over time? And the answer to this for most administrative data sets is almost certainly yes, and you've got to be really careful uh, if you're doing any sort of analysis over time that you're comparing the same thing. That, it, that, that, that your analysis of differences over time aren't just reflecting differences in how the data were recorded. Uh, so are there differences in recording practices or quality of recording between the people who contribute to a data set. So between providers, between hospitals, between, uh, between general practices, etc. cetera. Um, what, is, what, what actually triggers data to be recorded in this way? So, and particularly, is, it, is the recording of data or the likelihood that data are recorded is that related to any variables that you're interested in as a researcher? So, if you're working with general practice data from something like the CPRD, which I mentioned before, then you know, are people who go who, who visit their GP more likely to have their weight measured if they're overweight or if they have diabetes? And how is that sort of selection bias in uh, the data going to influence your analysis. Uh, and what is the coverage of your data set in terms of the target population for your analysis? And we'll talk more about um, coverage in a moment. And yeah, how has that coverage changed over time? So coverage might be geographic, things, uh, but it, it can also be in other dimensions. So. Uh, m most administrative data, most administrative services require, for, for somebody to be included and reflected in that data set, they require that 
the person had access to the service, which can be limited by geography, by language, by disability, by their lifestyle or work pattern. So, you know, they, um, if they spend half their time working overseas or remotely, then that might affect how often or how likely they are to be uh, reflected in the data set. Um, and it's also, uh, and, and whether they're included in the data, so they have to have access and they have to actually utilise it. And whether or not they actually utilise it can be affected by, well, like su supply side economics, so how much of the service is actually available to be used. Um, it can be affected by whether there are competing services, so other options for them to use. Uh, local variation in the quality of the service or the perceived quality of the service and cultural factors that all might impact on whether someone actually utilises the service and therefore is reflected in the data. Um, often, you know, a service is provided generally area-based and people come and go from areas and people die and are born. People immigrate and emigrate both locally, regionally and internationally and these events are often not captured in the administrative data and so you're often not sure what your population denominators are in your statistics. So you, you don't necessarily have a, a, a good handle on, um, on, you know, you might know how many people used the service but you don't know how many people didn't use the service. Um, and variables might not always be observed. So if somebody's emigrated or somebody was away, then, uh, then you, th they, they might have died or they might have had services elsewhere, but you treat them as if they didn't die or didn't have services elsewhere. So all of these things really can be <laughs> translated into effects of information bias or selection bias. These are <laughs> epidemiological terms Economists and so many social scientists might have a different idea about what I mean when I say selection bias. So economists often use selection bias to refer to what epidemiologists would call confounding, which is differences in the characteristics of um, different groups. But when I talk about selection bias, I'm talking about differences in the probability of being included in your data. And information bias is misclassification, so you treat someone as they're alive when in fact they're dead, so it's, it's a categorical variable that you've, that's been incorrectly measured, um, and measurement error is the same thing but with continuous variables, so how long somebody lived for is a continuous variable and if, if you haven't measured that somebody, if you haven't picked up that somebody's died then you might, if you're doing any sort of survival analysis or time-based analysis, you might over estimate how long they lived for. So that would be measurement error. Once you understand the previous problems in terms of information bias and selection bias, you can adjust for them. And uh, I highly recommend these texts by Lash and others. There's a textbook and there's a journal article which is a good place to start um, on accounting for information bias, uh, correcting for information bias and selection bias. So now, Last part, linkage error. This is what's specific to linked data. And we're going to talk about how to understand it, how to assess it, and how to address it. And this is, these are all things that are currently done really poorly in most research that uses linked data. Um, partly because we haven't been working with linked data on a big scale until quite recently, and partly because it's just really complex, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand and so I think people um, for a large part ignore it and also for a large part don't even realise the linkage that's gone on behind the scenes when analysing things like hospital episode statistics. So linkage error, There's so two types of errors that can occur in linkage. You've got missed links between records that belong to the same person or the same entity and false links between records that belong to different people. Uh, missed links are sort of primarily caused by 
errors and missing data in matching variables or variation in the values of those matching variables over time. So women are generally have higher rates of missed links. Why do you think that is? Change the name when they get married. False links um, occur primarily because of a lack of uniqueness or discriminatory power in your matching variables. So people with very common names are more likely to be subject to false links. And so certain ethnic groups that have much less variation in their surname, for example, are generally have higher rates of false links in their data. Uh, so if you've done any work in ep epidemiology, then you might be familiar with sensitivity and specificity from, um, from screening tests. And the same sort of two by two tables uh, can be applied to linkage error. And the same statistics in terms of sensitivity and specificity can be derived from this. So this is just a you know, a two by two table of the link status, whether the records are linked, and the match status, which is sort of the true, you know, whether these really do relate to the same person or really do relate to different people. Um, and if you can populate a table like this, then, and, and get estimates of sensitivity and specificity of linkage, then you can uh, correct for linkage error. So, uh, I said linkage error is complex, uh, and that's because it can corrupt your data in a lot of different ways. So, it can cause misclassification if you treat someone as alive when in fact they're dead because you've missed a link to the death register. It can cause measurement error if you overestimate how long someone lived because you missed a link to the death register. Um, it can cause missing data. Uh, so, you know, if you're linking to a birth register, you expect everybody to have a birth record and you're linking to get some additional information about their early life circumstances. But for some people, you can't find their link. You've got missing data for that, for those people. You know um, there was meant to be a link, you couldn't find it, so you don't have the data. Um, it can cause selection bias. So, if you exclude everyone with missing data, then you've got selection bias. If you've got misclassification or measurement error on criteria that you're using to define your study uh, sample, the people you want to analyse, and that's been misclassified because of linkage error, then that can cause selection bias. Um, if you've got missing data, that causes, if you've got less data, then you've generally got less statistical power, and if you've got lots of measurement error and misclassification creating noise in your data, then you've got less statistical power. This means wider confidence intervals, less precision in your um, estimates. And lastly, linkage error can cause something uh, really horrible that's a sort of combination of most of these things, uh, which is this phenomenon of splitting of units of people into multiple parts and merging of units together. So a, a, a missed link might mean that instead of one person who was admitted to hospital twice, you treat them in your data as if they're actually two people who were admitted to hospital once. And in effect, that person then has a 200% chance of being included in your data and they're misclassified in both of those cases. So like, this is a sort of really horrible form of corruption that involves both selection biases and misclassification or measurement error, and it's, uh, it, it, it's really specific to data linkage. And, and, and of course the inverse happens as well, where you, you merge people together into single units. Um, so some useful questions to ask to help you understand what the impacts of linkage error are in your analysis are, uh, is the presence or absence of a link meaningfully interpreted? So, for example, in the link to the death register, we interpret the presence 
of a link to a death register is meaning that the person has died. And we interpret the absence of a link to the, a death register as meaning that the person hasn't died. So understanding that, you know, if you are interpreting the presence or absence of links like that, then what will be the implications of linkage error for your analysis? And if not, then generally you're expecting there to be a link for everybody. And how are you going to handle missing data, missed links? Because there are different ways to handle missing data, and some of them are better than others. Does inclusion in your analysis, which is what I'm talking about when I say selection, depend on successful linkage? Does that, if, if linkage is not successful, are people going to be erroneously excluded or erroneously included in your analysis? Um, and is there possible on splitting and merging? If, you, if, if, if there are multiple possible records in one file or both files, then there's always going to be possible splitting and merging. If you're working with more than, if you're connecting more than two files, then you're working with, then there's always possible splitting and merging too. Um, and really importantly, is linkage error likely to be related to the variables that you're interested in? Because something we know about information bias and selection bias is that they're much worse when the, when, uh, the misclassification or the probability of selection is associated with the variables that you're interested in analysing. If, if they're not associated with the variables of interest that you're analysing, then they might be less of a problem. They might not be a problem at all in terms of selection bias, or they might be less of a problem in terms of information bias. Um, and there are some ways that we can test this. So, five ways that you can assess linkage quality, or that you might be able to assess linkage quality. Sometimes we can make comparisons of, uh, well, sometimes we can look at a, a, a gold standard subset of our linked data. So these are uh, a, a subgroup for whom we know the link status. We're confident in it for some reason. Maybe they had a certain high quality, well recorded, unique identifier, like NHS number that had been well recorded, uh, and we were able to link on that. But we didn't have that information for everyone else. If that subgroup's representative of the whole group, then uh, you, can, uh, you, you can work out all those values in your 2x2 two two table and you can adjust for linkage error. But gold standards are like gold, they're rare. Something that is much more common is to be able to do is comparisons with external reference statistics. So this might be statistics that have been generated from another source, um, or with the entirety of one of the data sets uh, that, um, that, that, that you're confident in and that your analysis sample should uh, be consistent with the same population or represent the same population and you can look at differences um, in the characteristics of your sample compared with uh, the external reference statistics. Sometimes you can conduct procedural sensitivity analysis, so this is using different decision rules and deterministic linkage or different thresholds in probabilistic linkage. And that's something that I didn't have time to talk about the detail of the thresholds, but um, the like different estimated probabilities of linkage at which you, beyond which you choose to classify people as links and below which you choose to classify them as non-links. You can change that threshold, just like you can change the decision rules. Uh, and if the data linker provides you information on the, 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 those probabilities or match scores or the different rules that were used, then you might be able to do this yourself. Um, comparisons of linked and unlinked records isn't going to be any help at all if you're talking about, say, linkage to a death register. But if you're talking about linkage to a birth register, then you, uh, th then you can compare the characteristics of the people who had, who you could find a link to the birth register with the characteristics of the people who you couldn't find that link with. And that will tell you about the distribution of missed links compared to your variables of interest, hopefully, if they're in the, um, your, your primary data file anyway. 
And uh, something you can do to look at the distribution of false links is to identify unlikely or implausible scenarios. So like people having activity after they're supposed to have died or people being admitted to hospital twice uh, at the same time. And things, the, the, the sort of unlikely or implausible scenarios that may exist in your data but shouldn't exist. And they won't let you measure the extent of false links, but they might let you measure the association of false links with the variables that you're interested in, at least, which is quite helpful. Um, in terms of addressing linkage error, the, the, the first and most basic thing that you should do is acknowledge and discuss it and try to unpick what the likely impacts are for your analysis using those questions that I gave you before. Um, you, uh, or, or there are sort of two approaches to correcting or adjusting for linkage error. Either you can correct for it in a sort of post hoc way by conducting sensitivity analysis or quantitative bias analysis after your main analysis, which attempts to ad adjust for the impacts of linkage error in terms of information bias and selection bias. Um, currently working on a, a sort of classification system for studies of linked data that will help you identify what the impacts are for your analysis. Uh, and, and that will also help you with your informal discussion too. Um, or there's sort of missing data-based approaches to analysis of linked data, uh, like imputation-based approaches. And there's actually some inverse probability weighting-based approaches that are starting to be developed as well. This is, these are stuff for the, uh, the enthusiastic analysis, uh, analyst, sorry. And they're, they're, um, they're pretty new, they're pretty um, complicated, but they're being uh, developed now. And these are, yeah, there's a techniques based on how we handle it. Missing data applied to linked data that sort of prospectively in, uh, uh, account for the uncertainty in the linkage process and feed that directly into the analysis. And uh, I've listed just some useful resources for you. So I, I teach a course on missing data with Katie Harron through the ADRCE. Um, there's uh, some good textbooks on both data linkage and, 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 and sensitivity analysis, quantitative bias analysis that I think is relevant. Um, some articles that are good places to start if you want to work with linked data or data linkage and uh, some of the work that will be coming out soon. Hi. Thank you.